Good afternoon. I know it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful afternoon. But we have a very special program, actually two programs. Uh, the first one, as you know, is the film uh, One Generation's Time, and it's to speak to the legacy of Silvio Domingo and Jean Baroness, who were both assassinated in 1981. The film will tell you the entire history of that, as well as the, 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 the men's uh, personal and political uh, history and their activity within the Union. It will be directly followed uh, by a presentation by Cindy Domingo, who is uh, Sony's sister, and also the National Coordinator for the Committee for Justice for, uh, for Domingo and Viernes. Also, um, we have also a very special guest as well, is Terry Mast. Terry Mast was Sony's widow and the mother of their two daughters. Terry played an instrumental role in carrying on Sony's work by cleaning out uh, the corruption, helping to spearhead the, the, um, the reform movement uh, in Local 37 of the ILW, and she'll share that. So um, directly after, of course, we're going to be having our commemoration of the 1965 uh, Grape Strike. But, um, Teresa Imperial, on behalf of the Manila, Manila Town Heritage Foundation, uh, would, uh, is going to give uh, a group of welcome greeting. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, First of all, welcome to the Eyes of Bell um, of the Manila Town Heritage Foundation. Um, yearly, we always do this labor fest, so it's always an honor to have this labor fest always here in Manila Town Eyes of Bell because the labor movement is also a big, um, a big part of the Eyes of Bell struggle itself because the moms were also I, um, um, farm workers, so you know, and during that time, well you know, going through the struggle um, is a very important um, piece of the of the movement itself. And also on behalf of Manila Town Heritage Foundation, um, I would like to welcome um, Cindy Domingo and Terry Mast for coming here and also facilitating this discussion. So thank you and welcome to Manila Town Heritage Foundation. And just a reminder, on August 4th is the 38th anniversary of the I Hotel Eviction Commemoration. So hopefully you guys can come at 6 p.m. here. Thank you. How many miles to go? How many mouths to be fed? How many words left unsaid? How many more may die before we strike the final blow? No one ever said that it would be easy. No one ever said we won't see that through. Somehow, though, I never thought that we'd be standing here without you, going on without you. How many forces stand against us, trying to strike us low? Whether they do flaws or use the guns to do what must be done. How many more may die before we strike the final blow? No one ever said that it would be easy. No one ever said we won't see it through. Somehow, though, I never thought that we'd be standing here without you, going on without you. But if it's justice that we are wanting, don't you know that won't come just in one day? Don't you know we've got to keep on fighting? They would want it that way, want it to be that way. Many banners to be raised. How many things to know? How many lessons from the years? How many songs? How many tears? How many more were led that we will give the final blow? For if it is justice that we are demanding, don't you know that won't come just in one day? Don't you know we've got to keep on fighting? They would want it that way, want it to be that way. Or if it's just it that we're changing, don't you know that won't come just in one day? 
จนชีวิตกรรมจะขี้ข้องไปในเมื่อวันนั้นจะเป็นวันที่ดีอีกแล้ว But if it's history that we're changing, when you know that won't come just in one day. Don't you know we got to keep on fighting? They would want it that way. Want it to be that way. Seems like just a few days ago or a couple of years ago, but 
it was important to document this part of the story because we are getting older. Uh, and because we got to document it. It was from their voices that the story got told. And uh, I think it's taken this long because we were all so busy. We we're always too busy to write our own history. And so it's only now um, that this story is being documented uh, through this book and the film. Uh, there are, uh, there's a couple of other, uh, three other projects that are in the process of being uh, uh, documented in relationship to this, this story. Um, Mike Whitby, uh, who was the lead lawyer of the case, is now writing a book about the, um, the uh, arrest role in the murders, which is very little talked about in this film. Uh, U.S. cooperation with the Marcos dictatorship in the Philippine government in uh, harassing, intimidating, and ultimately being responsible for Saudi and Jean's murder. And that is the part of the case that has never uh, been resolved, even though the U.S. government, uh, when they talked about the wrongful death lawsuit that was filed in law in 1989, that lawsuit that was filed in Three uh, was originally a class action lawsuit against the U.S. government and the Philippines government for uh, the civil rights violations of the U.S. based anti narcos movement. And through the discovery in that case, we found out that there was a Philippine infiltration plan in which the Philippines. Marcos government sent agents into this country to spy, harass, and move against uh, the U.S. based anti Marcos movement. And the U.S. government fully cooperated with that plan and did nothing to stop it. Um, and that was a violation of our civil rights because we were only doing, carrying out our democratic rights as guaranteed by the Constitution. Um, the U.S. government agencies um, and who were originally dismissed from the lawsuit based off of um, sovereign immunity um, and we have never been able to bring that case against the U.S. government back and uh, we are now in the process of trying to obtain uh, more documents to reopen that side of the case again. Uh, there are postcards here that Mike Whitby would like you to fill out so that he can send you his first chapter of his book and as well as give you updates about the process in which we're reopening this website. Uh, it's been over 30 years and sometimes they release some documents uh, redacted or sometimes they make mistakes and don't redact certain parts. <laughs> It's also in the process of finishing her manuscript about five women in the uh, anti Marcos movement. Three of them, six, six of them, uh, four are from the Philippines, women involved with the Philippines leaders in the Philippines, and two in the U.S., Julie Navila and myself. So slowly we will get this history written, slowly but surely, and most important from our voices, not somebody else's voices. So, um, I think, you know, we just want to kind of open it up for questions. Chris, uh, could you talk a little bit about the building of the front because that was such a significant part and I think it protected the activists in the center of the KDP. So, um, you know, within 24 hours of the murders, we were first found in the hospital. Um, we had already, I mean, this was, our critical thinking, our political analysis of knowing about our community. We already analyzed who would have benefited from these murders. The last parent of the owners of the cannabis, the Philippine government, because of the work Sound PG were doing with the as well as the US government, uh, because of the strategic importance of the Philippines. And the gangsters in the union. And so that was a very critical piece of uh, what, um, why we felt 
that we needed to build the broadest front to get justice for Sally and Jamie. But it wasn't just getting justice for Sally and Jamie in terms of covering the murder of them, but it was also important because as the bill it says that the people in the union had to go the next day and carry out the work of dispatch. And if you realize that the murder <coughs> was still on the street, the gang who we knew profited, who uh, benefited from the murders, were still involved in the union and would be in the union involved. And uh, so we knew that not only would we have to go beyond who we normally work in our political work, but we had to go to those that we have never worked with before. So the only people that could prosecute, who could bring those that were responsible for the murders to jail were the police and the prosecutor and those in power in the government, in the city. So within a very few days, we issued what was called the Call for Justice. And in order, because we knew that we were so had a role in this, uh, we, we made him be the first signature on the line, along with the mayor, the Filipino community, and, and the, the front that people who were uh, leaders in the anti-racist movement, in the women's movement, any prominent person that we could approach to, to appeal for justice and for all all those who knew anything about the sweater could come forward. As well, so that, that call was very important. And then to have Russo be at the forefront of it, kind of corner him in, uh, to say, you are going to be part of it, we're going to drag you to jail, part of it, we're going to be part of it, part of it responsible. And, and uh, because of the forces that could have been involved in these murders, we, you know, many of us not only belong to an organization, the organization of PTP, but we also belong to another radical organization called the Line of March. Unfortunately, Seattle had two, the, one of the, I think, the largest KTP chapters, and it was a multiracial chapter. We also had one of the largest Line of March chapters. And we were able to draw on those activists who had deep roots in all of their uh, communities to mobilize fully a citywide mobilization, a multiracial, multi-issue um, uh, focus, and focus on getting justice for Sally and Jean. And then because these were both national organizations, we were able to draw on the national organizations to also bolster the local, the local Seattle folks. And many people were transferred in those in that first year to help bolster the work and to help build that broad front. So without building that broad front, we would never have been able to pressure the police, the prosecutors, to fully investigate these cases. And we would have never, and it was only done through the building of the broad front. At a certain point, though, the prosecutor was no longer willing to go any further than just the hitman. And even Tony Russo was not as far as this, you know, until uh, 19, 1990. So it took almost 10 years for Tony Russo. Uh, you know, and, and that happened only because he won the civil suit, and only because the political conditions had changed in the Philippines, and the Marcos dictatorship was overthrown, and he was no longer protected by both the U.S. government because we persisted. You know, on the last day of the trial in 1989, on December 13th, December 14th, that was my birthday. The courtroom was packed. It was packed. It was very hard to do after 10 years. And some people came back home to be part of that, that victory. And at the victory party, there were the international solidarity act, the Chileans, the Salvadorians, people who were really concerned the racist movement. Some people came back to work on the case, my closer, who didn't get the transfer to Boston. Um, and so that front, it 
essence stay very firm to the very end of that period of time in which we want justice for some? There was, there was a doctor that lived here in San Francisco, Dr. Malaga, who was the, where the money was, uh, yeah, it wasn't in the consulate, but the money from the Marcos government went through him to Tony Cruz. And no, uh, we were never, we tried to get him on, but we were never able to have enough evidence for him. And a lot of the evidence actually came once Marcos left the Philippines and came on U.S. soil. Uh, we were able to have access to the documents that he brought with him, as well as take his deposition. And the film mentioned $50,000. And then he mentioned $500,000. All of the money. Tell me, mentioned so um, we had documents early on in 1981 that Tony Caruso in May took a two-day trip to San Francisco. We had the tickets. Um, in, in, in 1986, when Maruso came, uh, when Marcos came to Hawaii, he got a lot of documents. Um, one of the documents that was found by Juan Pasha Diego, who was an ex-CIA trained Philippine intelligence officer, who actually had a change of heart and mind in order to be part of the U.S. Space and Marcos team found this document. And in that document, in that, so it was the uh, balance sheet for the Mabuhai Corporation that Dr. Malaghan was handling. In that document, there were, there was a disbursement on the day that the Russo came to San Francisco, which went to the Philippine Health $15,000. And at the bottom, the bottom of that document was a signature, uh, was a handwritten note uh, signed by uh, General Baer saying, uh, this is an acknowledgement that $1.5 million was given to Mabuhai Corporation um, and signed by General Baer. So it was Juan Diego who put you know, this theory together, as well as the dates, you remember the dates, and the disbursement, and he knew it was 15 months. Who signed it? That's a one point five million. That's the one point five million. No. The gun, the gun was owned by the Russo. It was stolen. It was never reported it was stolen. And he had had previous gun stolen, which he supported. So that was it. So when Baruso, here it is, is that Baruso promised the gang $15,000. When Salmi was able to give the names of the, of the two hitmen, Baruso got scared, didn't want to give any more money. The gun was thrown in a garbage can in a park that was known where somebody would scavenge for across the street from Nicado's house. <laughs> there was a warning to Russo. They got your gun. You better up the money. And then the gun in those days, it was a Mac 10, which wasn't wasn't like it is today. It was very unusual. You couldn't just buy them on the street. It was a Mac 10 with a silencer. It was very unusual. Well, what about her? What is what? As a socialist alternative, um, is it, and I don't mean to put them on the spot, but I can tell if they're here. <laughs> but have they done anything to support the work that you're doing for justice? Currently, what do you mean about them? Back, well, back then, I don't think they existed. Yeah. But, yeah. but now, I'm talking about now. As I said, it's, it's very difficult to get people. 
information about U.S. Philippine intelligence. Uh, um, we, when we went in 2011, uh, when Sally and Jane were placed on the wall, they weren't, they weren't only the first Philippine Americans, they were the first trade union leaders placed on the wall. There were no even Philippine trade union leaders on the wall. Uh, we, we met with uh, the head of the Human Rights Commission and asked her to help us with any further information you know, in the archives of the National Defense Archives. You know, they had discovered thousands and thousands of documents uh, and, you know, dealing with human rights violations. And at this point, we haven't gotten any. Uh, and so, you know, it depends what we can get before we launch any kind of formal kind of campaign to, to complete this structure justice. Could you explain a little bit how you guys were able to, to change that around? Well, I think as Cindy said, you know, we pretty, we knew as soon as the murders happened that it wasn't just the street came. Um, we clearly knew, especially once Sony named who they were. Uh, I think you heard Lynn say that someone in the film said uh, that one of the gang members had been in the Union Hall the week before. I happened to have been there in the Union Hall that day, and I had worked in Alaska with two of those pitmen, so I knew, I knew them. And I knew who they were and what they were capable of. So as soon as we were at the hospital, uh, and as soon as we, Mike Whitney, our attorney, came to the hospital and said who, was, who the hitmen were, uh, I knew that the Tony Brewer was doing that. And so we, we knew that it had higher, and we knew who he was linked to, so we knew it had higher implications. So we really fought with the uh, prosecutors to try to go further. And, uh, you know, I think as Cindy said, it took years to get Caruso. Uh, you know, they arrested him when his gun was found, but they didn't charge him. He was let go. Uh, actually, we we got him to prison um, before this uh, because in the union, he had uh, falsified some union elections, and he, he also had um, double dipped, as they say, where he had turned in receipts to both the union and the uh, trust, our health and welfare trust, for the same thing. And so we brought him up on the charges for that. And you know, sometimes you get a, you know, you get a lot of connections. And, you know, sometimes you remember who your friends are, and they land up in good places. Well, the uh, the judge that saw, heard the case of, of uh, the embezzlement happened to be a very close ties to Longshore. He had worked his way through college by working longshore. So he didn't forget the ILWU and the importance of union democracy in the ILWU. So he got three years in prison for $5,000. That's, that's probably not going to happen today, right? <laughs> but, you know, so uh, we already getting transferred to school. But, <laughs> There were a lot of things along the way, um, but you know, the F, you know, things like the FBI approached uh, us and said, you know, rather than than going after Russo, they, you know, we give him immunity to get the hit man. We're like, what? No, I mean, we know who the hit We already know who the hit man are. Why do you need that? So there were a number of things in the process that pointed to much higher ops and protection of certain people in the process. So we said we're still developing some of this, but I think the important thing is that the film that we just saw and the importance of people knowing that this happens in this country. You know, we know that trade unions get killed all around the world. We hear about it in Colombia, we hear about it in Mexico, we hear about it in lots of places. But a lot of us, a lot of people don't know that it happens right here in our own country. And that our country, that our government was uh, listening to this one. Even though we can't prove it, we know that. A, a foreign dictator is not going to make a hit here in this country without somebody knowing about it. Well, uh, and in the process of the of the trials, uh, they brought four witnesses to try to, you know, try to um, totally go against 
against the case we were putting on, they brought fake witnesses forward that we know were part of the FBI. We know that they witnessed the murders and then tried to cover it up. So I think the important thing is to talk about it for people to know. Uh, you know, the, what has happened with uh, Snowden, you know, trying to, he tried to bring forth what our government is doing in terms of spying. <laughs> I mean, those of us in the movement know that that has been going on forever. Uh, and But it seems like it's even getting worse because it's not even spying against the movement anymore. It's, it's almost anyone who might have a different opinion about something. So I think it's more to educate, you know. And I, the reason the film is called One Generation's Time is because we want to share our story to the next generation so that things can change, that things don't and I've worked with local sort of government for many, many, many years ago. And I realized one thing, like this was all about the murders. And I didn't know, we didn't know anything. The first person recruited by the women in the city. We did not know anything about the, the kind of racial segregation that happened. We knew that one of the people who was up there working with the tactics for tactics was named Carlos instead of Carlos. They wouldn't hire you know, us anymore. They would, but if you pretended to be Mexican, they would hire them. They were so worried about, you know, the Ella Piero's, you know, uh, organizing. And they would receive stuff like that. In other words, in the film, the book was so important. The management actually tried to use the murders of the Anastasia and the organizing. Most of this was a disgusting thing on the bottom of the bulletin board of faculty. Oh, this union is so corrupt, they feel it's a man with them. I was wondering, because it's really strikes me, I mean, it seems like a real point that I, I really felt a lot of, uh, a lot of was shown at that time, right after they were murdered, is that the next day in the hall, I would like to have a description of what happened. Who was the inspector? What happened? What was the union in the hall? What was the union in the hall? So, um, the, you know, thank you. So, we put together a dispatch team. So, we had, you know, put together the reform movement was part of the committee. So it wasn't, you know, any one person. It wasn't just Gene, even though he was a dispatcher. We had put together a reform platform around. Uh, system and we have been posting it in the hall so that members would know that if anyone approaches you with a, about a bribe, that's not that's not us. That's not the new system that's functioning here. And we have been posting this for you know weeks before it came to be dispatch time and letting members know what the new system was going to be. And so after Gene was murdered, we put a team together instead of a dispatch. We put a dispatch team that uh, was Brother Avery, Brother Chasson, Bell, Angel Domingo, Alonzo Susan, and, and David Bell and John Locke. And they pretty much uh, went in and did the dispatches. And then, you know, we had a lot of help, not only from um, all the organizations that Cindy mentioned, but also from the labor movement. Uh, and our own union. So they came in, <laughs> some of the trades came in and built a wall for us uh, with what we thought was like bulletproof glass. But of course it really wasn't. I mean, it, it was really thick. <laughs> and so, you know, we made a different kind of dispatch system um, and some protection for ourselves. Because, you know, as Mara said, as whoever said that, the gang members were still there. They were still in the union, and they would line the, the side of the, uh, the hall every day and make their presence known and try to intimidate us. And, and when we'd be working at night in the hall, they'd drive by and make sure that we knew. So we, have, we did have police protection as well as other union people be at the hall uh, and the movement people to be there to, to protect us. That was how we were able to function. And some of the, you know, the old timers from the you would come and sit in the hall with us every day. You know, and just be there and just be a presence. And, and we had our community for justice meetings every week. Mm -hmm. So that we had any questions.
The United States is pushing Japan, Korea, the Philippines, all these countries to militarize. And you know, one of the political problems is there's no opposition from all politicians. There's no opposition to militarization of Asia. And I think the Labor has to start using education itself. Why this is going to be definite all over here and there. So I think uh, the lesson of that is the disconnection between what the United States is doing here and what they do in the Philippines and other countries is very much connected. So I think that's something that, that has to happen more. I mean, I, Japan is changing their constitution yeah. the war. Uh, you know, Korea is arresting people, arresting Canadians, privatization. There's a big attack on democratic workers' rights in the nation. So I think that's a capacity we have to do. Uh, our community, like many of the communities along, especially uh, many of the communities, uh, all of the communities across the nation are divided in terms of their pro and anti Marcos viewpoints. Uh, and, you know, that was the role of the KP to educate the Filipino community on the reality of the Marcos dictatorship and the human rights violations and the ties between the U.S. and Filipino, the U.S. support. So we knew that we were not going to be able to count on the Filipino community to fully lead the struggle for justice. And in Seattle, that was more so true because the murders had further polarized the community and in essence silenced some of the people in that community. So it was important that others take up that banner to lead and to not be afraid and to, again, you know, provide the, the, the uh, front to, to come and spread a board and say, you know, the dictatorship was probably responsible, especially in those first couple of years, for these murders. So, um, you know, the Filipino community is very different now in terms of its openness to progressive politics. Even in Seattle, you know, the new leadership, the old guard uh, that opposed our work, the KT work, and for justice is gone now, and you know, just like in the Philippines, the contributions of Sal and Jean and the U.S. based anti Marcos uh, movement is recognized, so it is also in some of the Philippine communities across the United States as well as in Seattle. Can you just add to the U.S. as the one of the things that's happening now with the Trans Pacific Act? So you see in the Philippines, there's a big move course in the ruling class to push both Marcos, which is Marcos' yeah. son. Mm -hmm. They're going to push for him to be president because he's going to be just as much of as his father was. And so we're seeing that coming up now. Everyone's talking about both being the next president. And, and that's why it's important that, especially in the Philippines and the Filipino community, the history of the Marcos dictatorship is told. Uh, because about 50% of the people now in the Philippines were born after the dictatorship. And so unless this history is told, they will vote for someone like Volvo Marcos. Unless they, the, that's why the Wall of Martyrs and the museum that documents the violations of the Marcos dictatorship are very important. Uh, and the history of the Philippines books is important to be told so that people will not consider the Marcuses uh, for presidency or for higher policy. Yeah, so I'm going to take one more question because I think we have to wrap up because there's another film. Let's <laughs> hope some people are coming forward and so we can have a little break in between. But yeah, I apologize for coming in late, but um, yeah. um, if this is a human rights case, um, can I have any questions on behalf of the United States government? Um, you know, I don't think so because I think that's more targeted than the Well, so we have actually, um, we have actually filed, you know, the Kino government and Congress have actually formed a fund for those that are victims of human rights violations during the Marcus period in file claims. And Salmon and Jean, we have filed a claim for Salmon and Jean for murder. Um, and uh, well, 
probably get that money because we have our cases already been proven because there was martyrs on the wall, the wall of martyrs uh, have already been served, their cases have been served. So we we are not we do not have any problems against the you know, president of the government and Corey you know, actually cooperated with us to some extent. Uh, and before we went to, to court the federal case in 1989, we released the bill of the government under 40 and they cooperated with us to some extent. Before I close, I wanna I just want to share a story about um, Gene's friend talked about when a generous person he was in the in 2011, as part of the preparation for um, our case to get some engineer on the wall, um, the Ohio Museum, which are the people that certify who gets on the wall after they've done an investigation about the cases, the woman that was doing the investigation had some engineer's paperwork on the table. And one of the board members asked her husband to come in because it was very hot outside. And he looked at the table and he saw Jean's picture. And he said, I know that man. This is 30 years later. I know that man. And he said, how do you know that man? I took him to the country science. He took him to the NPA, to the NPA bill territory so that you need to experience what it was like to be with the NPA to the exposure what they call exposure. And he said, he was asked to take Gene because he spoke English. And so he documented his story for us uh, of what he talked to Gene about. And on the very last night, he took asked Gene, do you think you can help us? If I asked you to be to be with us in the countryside, would you do that? And Jean said, he said, the man said, Jean looked at she was kind of uh, pale, right? Because <laughs> he sees something. And he said, and for Filipino he's a little bit big. And he said, you know, I, I'm kind of white, and I'm kind of big, and, people, and I might be a target. <laughs> But I will do whatever I can. I will serve it if that's what you want me to do. That's the kind of That was his first time in the Philippines that he was willing to give what he could for the struggle in the Philippines. So that's, that's what kind of person he was. Uh, it is adapted uh, 
the, uh, the labor force assisted us in being a jack to get to the old um, uh, IWW battle at the Noble Lobby. But the IWW had uh, their famous song, of course, it's My Brain, My Saw, Joe Hill last night.